Hello again. The purpose of this uh, video is to discuss a very important part of uh, Sri Lanka law, which is actually connected to the law of the sea, and where uh, Sri Lanka has uh, actually ratified this particular law, and, and that particular law covers a substantial portion of Sri Lanka sea, especially the territorial sea, and the video focuses on that, and later we'll be focusing on the other aspects of uh, our sea, which is a contiguous zone as well as an exclusive economic zone. So, you know, I don't need to tell about the importance of the sea when it comes to the resources and the rest for the world. And if you take a look at the world, right, much of the commerce, much of uh, the transportation, and okay, a big part of our history is connected to the sea. You know, man moved from, um, let's say, the central sub-Saharan region of Africa towards the north and a group of people moved towards the Indian Ocean Islands. So that's how we moved on from continent to continent and their sea played an integral part of our culture. This is Sri Lanka or the ancient Ceylon for that matter based on Ptolemy's map of the world. And if you take a look at it, uh, you could see how much of uh, Sri Lanka was known, Taprobana they call it, to the ancient Greek Roman world. And that seafaring, ocean traffic, ocean transportation, ocean based commerce. So, ocean played a huge role. And with that came the challenge of actually who owns the ocean. And under the Roman law, we had this res nullius. That means, you know, the property or the area, land that no one can claim. That means, okay, I own a particular land, what's beyond me was. Res nullius, and there was one something more important, res communis. That was kind of territory not owned by any country. We're talking the high seas. Even in the mighty Roman Empire, right, one of the greatest of empires in the world, uh, you know, Roman Empire realized that there exists a land or a territory that even the Roman Empire cannot claim. High seas. During the 17th century, long before the uh, you know, modern era, but after the Renaissance, you know, the countries used to consider, you know, a distance that a cannon shot or a cannon ball can travel up to maybe three, four nautical miles as the land belonging to the country. The ancient customs are there with regard to who owns the sea. Then there was this particular Hugo Grotius, a uh, Dutch a jurist, a philosopher, you can say. He espoused the idea of the freedom of the seas. He developed a principle called the Mari Liberum, Liberum Principle. Sorry, you know he said that you know the seas shall belong to everybody. No nation shall claim the sea. This is him, Hugo Grotius, a highly influential person in the development of the modern international law, and one of his key principles was the Mari Liberum Principle. Um, you know with the development of the 17th, 18th centuries, countries started uh, taking care of the continental shelf. We'll take a look at the picture later. That means, uh, you know, the land mass that uh, extends to the sea and then kind of makes a huge drop into the deep seas or the ocean depth. So that particular top land mass is called as a continental shelf. Normally, the country started taking care of that area. Um, here, you can see that. So this is the landmass uh, which is extending into the sea underneath the waters but not too deep, maybe a few hundred, perhaps a thousand feet deep and then massive depth. So this region is called as a continental shelf and kind of countries started uh, claiming that era, area, area, sorry, after the Second World War, long before, bit before that, right? something like 12 nautical miles, you know, some countries started claiming up to 200 nautical miles where some areas, the, you know, the continental shelf goes deeper into the sea. So the country started claiming that. But we did not have an international sort of an agreement or a convention or a treaty on it. In 1958, United Nations created four treaties, or rather four conventions. Yeah, these are the four of them. Some of the countries signed, but they were not universally or globally accepted. Um, right, as global law, but then... Uh, in 1982, combining all four conventions and more, the world created what you call as a Law of the Sea Convention for these five purposes. To identify where sovereignty of a nation stands or stops. 
and sharing the ocean for development yes and how to con I mean, contribute to the freedom of navigation without or commerce right without uh, unimpeded without impeding without being impeded by the national interests and yes in environment and more important military activities that means when a gunship or when a warship travels in the sea can other nations stop it or can other nations allow it so that part so these are the fundamentals of the yun unclos or yun clause we call it um, countries have certain sovereign rights for portion of the land we call it territorial sea and then beyond that common heritage of mankind so this principle first came up earlier but later it was made into a law with the law of the sea convention and it is still the most comprehensive international treaty ever signed even to date 82 119 states signed it initially but later many other countries uh, joined in on initially the european union countries abstained including the usa usa still refuses to sign it um, but uh, at the moment we have something like uh, 100 yeah 165 signatory nations signing that means every nation with an ocean connected to it has signed it except for few countries like turkey um nations like soviet union sorry i'm sorry nations like usa and a few other nations like eritrea have not signed israel uh, you know and syria but most other nations have signed it us still relies on the custom rule but normally as a custom us follows the rules of the united nations law of the sea conference convention once 60th nation has ratified it it has become a global law or accepted international law these are the nations that have not signed it you can see some of the landlocked countries okay maybe less relevant for it uh, they have the you know caspian sea here i'm sorry uh yeah in caspian sea it is black sea so turkey hasn't signed it eritrea is yet to sign some arabian nations african nations right landlocked haven't signed it but see even the landlocked countries have signed it like mongolia there's no land nearby like bhutan nothing is close by right by way for C. So it's a globally recognized law. And you know, the law of the sea convention is not just a convention, but it has a legal system as well. By international tribunal for the law of the sea. We call it uh, ICLOS. It helps nations uh, to find peaceful way to settle disputes. And there have been number of disputes or the cases that uh, the law of the sea conference has signed some of them i'll be discussing in the second lesson and there's an existing problem going on a huge problem in the south china sea dispute where the china is claiming a huge territory uh, as they are sea but nearby countries like the japan philippines malaysia brunei vietnam they don't like it so there's a dispute going on but under the law of the sea conference right agenda it's possible to settle even the hardest of disputes take a look at this you know how about uh, exploring the resources on the seabed which country should be given the right so we have the international seabed authority again united nations law of the sea convention before that just a conference later convention so they've come up with that also actually we don't have the capacity to uh, dig into the seabed because it's way too deep 10 15 thousand feet deep we don't have that capacity yet but the law already exists if a nation is to go into the deeper sea for drilling they have to get the permission of the international seabed authority you could do that inside your exclusive economic zone not beyond that you're not allowed to do that okay let's talk about the main purpose of this lesson discussing the territorial sea of a country that is a baseline what's the baseline baseline is the point where uh, you know the you know the uh, what you call the the low tide begins there's high tide then there's a low tide the point where the low tide begin is uh, the base and from there we calculate up to uh, 12 nautical miles that is nautical miles that's different to a normal mile more than two kilometers per nautical mile there 12 miles 12 nautical miles that's territorial sea that's exactly as the law of the land every law that's applied to the land is applied to that 12 nautical miles area we call it the territorial sea the country has a complete power in that area but of course 
within the territorial sea, ships are allowed to pass in innocent passage. That means when there are international sea lanes and along which the ships are allowed to pass through. For example, if you take Sri Lanka, there are we, we have something like around um, you know around uh, sixty thousand ships per year pass through the sea lane close to Sri Lanka. There are two sea lanes close to Sri Lanka, especially the southern sea lane. More than 60,000 uh, ships pass through. 5,000 ships enter the harbors, uh, Colombo Harbor. So they can have the right of innocent passage without being disturbed. And yes, so we could do the fishing research, uh, weapon use. We can do it ourselves, but others are not allowed to do it without our permission. It's illegal to do. We can take legal action against them if they do. So, um, and of course, we have duties with regard to the territorial sea. Sri Lanka maintains a series of uh, lighthouses, Pradipagara, right? And we have various other coast guard systems and Sri Lanka Navy is deployed, right? To protect the shipping during that, uh, when the ship is during our going, going through our sea lane, we have a duty to protect the ships, secure the navigation route. So that's our duty, but there we have a lot of rights as well. So when it comes to the sea, there are three zones. Territorial zone is what we discussed. The entire law of the sea app applicable here. Whatever wrong happens, we can take action there. And of course, the contiguous zone is there. Beyond that, the exclusive economic zone. In the other lessons, we'll be discussing the contiguous and exclusive economic zone. So here, the purpose is to focus ourselves on internal waters or the uh, next uh, territorial sea. So this is Sri Lanka's uh, rights to the sea. You can see the massive exclusive economic zone, huge 200 miles nautical miles area. If you calculate the area, you can see it's completely higher than the land mass of Sri Lanka, which is 65,525. Internal waters, territorial sea, much bigger uh, than we think, right? And then the contiguous zone, huge. If you combine uh, territorial sea and the contigu contiguous zone, it's almost half of Sri Lanka. And then the exclusive economic zone, how many times that is of Sri Lanka. Within that area, we could exploit our oceanic uh, resources, fish or drilling or dredging or whatever, right? Contiguous zone, some rights we have. And uh, internal waters, we have complete exclusive rights. But if you look at here, we don't extend it to here because of Indian territory is very close. So here, Sri Lanka has a rough what you call as a territorial sea without a contiguous zone. Extend all the way to the Kachitiv Islands here. So this area belongs to uh, Sri Lanka as a territorial sea. We have not exercised our contiguous zone here because of Indian uh, land is very, very close. Yeah. Kachiti belongs to Sri Lanka, so, it, so Sri Lankan territory extends into the Indian zone. This is, uh, in a nutshell, the picture. You could see the baseline at the low tide level. That means that the tide is high, it may be here, tide is low, it's here. From here, 12 nautical miles. Territorial sea, everything here we own. Every action here we can take. Every law here applies here. Then you have 12 nautical miles, contiguous zone, right? From uh, where the territorial sea ends, 12 nautical miles. That's a certain amount of power we do have in the contiguous zone. Right, with regard to preventing environmental damage, you know, maintaining our customs and all right, prevention of illegal activities, prevention of smuggling, or uh, things like that, right? And then we have the exclusive economic zone where we have the right of exploring, exploiting, not just the sea, even the sea bed, we could exploit. Beyond the 2,200, sorry, we have high seas. Here, of course, if you have to do any activity, we have to get the seabed authorities' permission for dr uh, drilling and other things. And even for fishing, there are some restrictions. Um, for example, Sri Lanka agreed to not to fish in the high seas for uh, bluefin tuna fish. Uh, because uh, we have to allow high seas to be kept for the fish to breed. So we are allowed to fish uh, only in the exclusive economic zone. Sri Lanka agreed, but many countries violate the rule though. Sadly. Even if it's a rocky outcrop like this, 12 miles across it, right around it is uh, 
what territorial sea another 12 mile exclusive economic zone that's the thing so kachitiw island we have our rights extended right and south of sri lanka we have the great bases maharavana kutu kudaravana kutu so our territory is chutta extended there some countries like india they have some territories like uh, you know the lakshadweep islands or the andaman islands so around it they have this 12 12 uh, territorial territorial waters and the exclusive economy zone but for artificial islands this is not given not just the sea right even over the air we have the sovereignty over territorial sea but remember innocent passage has to be allowed for vessels and the washing Means passing through without harming us, passing through without causing trouble, passing through minding their own business. We have to allow it. And yes, laying submarine cables. What are submarine cables? You know, lots of internet traffic happens through the undersea cables, so that can be laid with the permission. Right? Yeah. What's the meaning of innocent passage? You know, ship moving from point to point in transportation. So if the ship has to happens to go through a territorial waters of a country it should be allowed right in continuous and expeditious manner right of course when you do that when you do that there are certain restrictions on the uh, ship these are the rights of the country take a look yeah we can put all our laws here in the uh, territorial waters and yes innocent passage had to ensure navigation protect protection of resources fisheries pollution scientific research all that we do have the power and the same power is extended to the contiguous zone as well most of these rights are there but more rights exist for the territorial sea you could use any law but when it comes to the contiguous zone our rights are somewhat limited we'll be discussing that later So, but there are restrictions on the sovereignty of a coastal state in the territorial sea. What are they? We cannot disturb a ship going on innocent passage, harming no one, disturbing no one. Yeah, we do have the right of criminal jurisdiction over the uh, territorial sea regarding the stopping of illicit traffic or narcotics or anything illegal. Um, but uh, you know, whenever a ship comes to our harbor and leaves, yeah, we can charge. but we cannot do the same for ships just doing the passage or warships or non commercial vessels like you know the yacht and all we can't play many claims and this is the criminal jurisdiction an important part for sri lanka because ours is an ocean state imagine a nation with 60000 ships passing through so we have immense amount of ocean assets ocean rights and ocean resources uh, and ocean income that we could get so criminal law plays a big role there so under the international law of the sea convention we do have it we cannot take action against a ship uh, criminal law on using the criminal law we cannot take action with regard to something that happened on board a ship while on passage under uh, you know the international law of the sea convention but we do possess certain rights what is it if it's a crime connected to sri lanka yes we can take action if uh, if the ship has left the country now ship is sailing in the internal waters we can take action right and if the particular crime may be a explosion or something on board a ship which may disturb the peace of the country yes we can take action criminal law or the ship has asked us to come and help them let's say there's a murder on board the ship something like that then yeah upon request we can respond and yes if we identify the ship is not doing normal commerce but something like illicit illegal traffic or people smuggling or narcotic or drugs they are we could take action under the law of the sea convention take a look at this so uh, we cannot arrest or stop a ship just passing through the territorial sea right uh, on innocent passage but if a ship has ship has left us after doing a crime in the harbor let's say hasn't paid the levy so hasn't done hasn't released the bunk oil or ballast water without permission so there are we can you know even after the ship leaves the harbor we can chase behind the ship and take action but remember no action can be taken against warships that is not possible if the warship is on passage 
without uh, you know the with their personal out of the gun stations troops lined up right to show that they don't mean any harm yeah you can't take any action against the warship civil law yes uh, actually we can't take civil action against a ship but we do possess some rights under some other laws let's say regard regarding the pollution of the seas we have some other uh, conventions and treaties that we have signed under that we can take action if the uh, particular ship has polluted uh, the ocean bed or something yes some action is possible under civil law but other than that uh, our right to take action against the ship is uh, highly limited under civil law yeah what are the coastal states powers even a submarine has to float on top with the flag flying every ship passing sri lanka must show they are flag of state or the flag where flag of the state where the ship has been registered and unless in distress they should be expeditious in passing through sri lanka right they can't stop or they can unload load people load goods nothing can be done they have to pass in peace if not we can take action this is how a submarine should go or ship should go right you know the personnel should be on board at least a number of them and showing that they mean no harm gun should be lowered and gun station should not be manned by personnel so that means they are passing in peace and we shall allow it yeah when a ship goes uh, on innocent passage there is this uh, thing right they can't use any threat of force against the sovereignty of the country they cannot practice weapons they can't exercise weapons drills or anything nothing they can do and they should do nothing that uh, you know harm or hurts or threatens the defense or security of the coastal state and they cannot do any kind of propaganda or they can't launch land take on board anything or anyone they can't load or unload anything or anyone and they cannot do any kind of pollution then we can take action they can't do fishing we can take action if they do they can't do research or survey without our permission right they cannot interfere with our communication systems or jamming or anything we can take action there true any other activity that is not having any direct bearing on the passage not allowed nuclear shop ships or uh, ships carrying dangerous cargo must disclose their cargo before entering the passage 